I'm, I'm going to start to talk about is the last session on micro budgetation. Uh, all all the panelists have actually gone with um, all the panelists have actually gone with uh, with most of the uh, 2017 guidelines. So I got the, the the role of actually presenting a couple of cases in MR uh, in hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy patients. And we are going to talk about two different scenarios. We are going to start uh, with one, which is uh, purely associated with SAM, and another one where you have uh, uh, concomitant uh, valve abnormality. So most of it, um, I have a couple of uh, competing interests. Uh, I was actually granted uh, a couple of uh, grants from the Canadian Society of Anesthesia and uh, from the Peter Moon Cardiac Center Innovation Committee grant in uh, in a study that I'm doing in long ultrasound, but nothing that is disclosed to these uh, to these uh, case presentations. So the first case, as as we talk, uh, demographics like uh, it's a seventy a seventy year old female, like uh, pretty standard one fifty five centimeter, fifty nine kilos, COPD, mild glaucoma. So he come in, and that's the report that we got from the pre op echo. Okay, so they say like uh, pursue gradients. Uh, up to 160 with Valsalva, symmetric septal hypertrophy, and uh, again, moderate MR, but the MR was not well visualized with severe SAM, and the RBSP is estimated of 32 millimeters. So this is one of the multiple uh, choice questions that we will actually discuss at the very end, but uh, when is an anterior mitral valve leaflet plication recommended in Hocon? going for septal myotomy in the absence of a rheumatic or other intrinsic mitral valve disease. And those are the answers. Well, when you have a floppy or lax anterior leaflet, when your anterior mitral leaflet measures more than three, more than 16 millimeters to the, to the square in the exit, or the MR is at least moderate, is the presence of some or all of the above. Um, so I have here a couple of images from the preoperative uh, transthoracic echo. And uh, as you can see here, uh, we clearly see the hypertrophy on both. But uh, when the time arrives to actually assess the mitral regurgitation, so what we mostly see is that. So the report, again, the MR is not well seen, appears to be at least mild to moderate. And that's what we start with. So then is when the patient actually arrives to the OR and we do our assessment. So intraop assessment. Again, uh, there is a clear example of uh, some in this patient, this massive septum, okay, how the uh, anterior mitral leaflet is touching the, the septum and avoiding the uh, LBOT outflow tract to actually uh, uh, provide flow to the aortic valve, no? Um, in that situation, we are going to go ahead and then assess the interventricular septum. Uh, we look for the number four here. There are three measurements that are required. Those measurements are very well reflected in, uh, in the new guidelines from 2019 from uh, uh, Mikoara, okay, that they have been already exposed. And then again, you want to measure your maximum thickness. You want to measure the apical extent of the septal bulge, which is going to be this measurement up, up here. The maximal thickness, and then the last one is from the annulus up to the to the mitral septal contact of the anterior mitral leaflet. So, regarding the mitral apparatus, uh, we are going to talk a little bit about that uh, uh, further on this case presentation. But very important, the length of the anterior mitral leaflets and the residual length of this anterior mitral leaflet beyond the coaptation point. And again. Uh, susceptibility to some when this leaflet measures more than three centimeters or more accurately more than 16 millimeters per meter to the square okay so just have that in mind when you assess those patients okay so now we are going to talk a little bit about uh, the type of regurgitation so whenever we have a patient with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy and we have some we are going to find a dynamic and posteriorly directed jet Okay, because the anterior leaflet plicates into the LVOT and then it opens a space there that is going to actually uh, like a koan effect going against the anterior leaflet and then going posteriorly directed. Okay, and that's what we look. This is an image of the four chamber view with color compare. Okay, and those are the scallops of your mitral valve there. So if we can, uh, we keep looking. So again, mitral commissure view.
close the valve to see more of it. Okay, we go to the two chamber view again, a little bit more, and we finally arrive to the long axis view. Okay, posteriorly directed jet, full acceleration in the BOT. Okay, some clearly contact into the septum. Okay. And a, and a jet that is uh, walling pinging into the left atrium, okay, which is consistent with a, a qualitative assessment of the matter regurgitation, which will be severe. And we will go to that in a second. Someone's at my door. So, as we have explained, the three main characteristics of this jet, okay, it's um, uh, related to SAM, it's always going to be posteriorly directed and a dynamic jet uh, with the Venturi effect of the anterior matter leaflet getting trapped into the LVOT. Uh, you're going to have an anterior valve, which is going to be uh, abnormally, abnormally displaced, and then you're going to have an abnormal uh, insertion of the papillary muscles. With, uh, with an, uh, an abnormal attachment. But remember, in all those cases, there is up to a 10 to 20% of patients which the MR is not related to some, okay? Which is good to remember. Okay, so what, what, which type of uh, mitral regurgitation uh, do we have in those cases? So unfortunately, uh, those guidelines in 2017, uh, there is no no actually classification for MR related to SAM, okay? Say that, there are many papers that the study are always HOCOM patients um, when they have a concomitant mitral regurgitation, all the regurgitations uh, associated with MR, no. We say like 10, 20% of them, they have another concomitant lesions on the mitral valve. But interestingly, and I find from this paper from 2008, uh, they were actually able, they were actually able to they were actually able to, to go with all the percentage of people that they were able to find. And then up to 70% of them show like a, a classification and thickening of the mitral valve, up to close to 60% and a prolonged anterior mitral leaflet and a shortened posterior mitral leaflet and up to 31, an excessive motion of the mitral valve, okay? So it's something that you need to have in consideration. Okay. So, Intraoperative assessment. So based on the guidelines that we have been studying during the whole morning, okay, so what we normally recommend, you have qualitative, uh, semi-quantitative, and quantitative. I like quantitative because it's an objective measurement, so I normally use PISA in my studies. You go up with the baseline, you go between 30 and 40 centimeters to the square towards the regurgitant jet, and then you freeze the image, you measure your PISA radius with your PISA radius, your allies in velocity, the one directed on the up uh, towards the regurgitant jet. And then with that, the computer is going to do your estimation for your effective regurgitant orifice with the max MR regurgitant jet. And it's going to give you the MR regurgitant volume with the BTI of the MR regurgitant jet. So it's three steps and you get the measurements. So here you will be able to quantify based on the guidelines, okay, effective regurgitant orifice between 0.2 and 0.4, regurgitant volume between 30 and 60 milliliters, okay? And if you pay attention here, your effective regurgitant orifice will be consistent with moderate, your regurgitant volume will be mostly consistent with severe, so that's where the range actually move. So, other things that we can use, instead of using the PISA method, you can use the volumetric method. Okay, so for volumetric method, it's based on the same things that they use uh, to actually calculate uh, mitral regurgitation with MR. And then your regurgitant volume is going to be your stroke volume on the mitral valve minus the stroke volume on the LVOT. The stroke volume on the mitral valve, you can do it by the anonymous of the mitral valve and the inflow of the mitral valve. And after that, you can calculate your regurgitant fraction. Rather, if you obtain the regurgitant volume by pizza or by volumetric method, and you divide it by the stroke volume, okay? So then, based on that, again, between 30 and 50% of the regurgitant fraction, you actually quantify your matter of regurgitation, okay? So semi-quantitative methods, we are all familiar with that already. So when a contractor with uh, pulmonary vein flow, if there is a systolic, that's a sign of severity, mitral inflow, you have a, a predominant pattern, which is most consistent with 
velocity more than one kilometers per second. So this is more consistent with severity and qualitative again. So there is something called uh, uh, flow convergence, which basically is if you are able to see your PISA envelope without changing your mean cruise limit. And if you have all of the astolic uh, flow convergence, so this is a, a, a qualitative sign to actually say that there is severity. Uh, continuous with Doppler jet, the density of the jet, and the color of the Doppler jet uh, area too. If it's more than 50% of the left atrium or if it's walling ping in, in the left atrium. All those are signs of severity. So in the case that we just present, uh, the surgeon decide to go ahead and do a septal myectomy, one centimeter of thickness, and then five centimeters into the ventricle. And then he actually displays the papillary muscles to actually try to mobilize a little bit to the posterior part, the aortic, uh, the mitral lamellus. So it will open a little bit the LVOT. Uh, he performed an autotomy, which is another thing that you can do in those cases when the angle between the aorta and the septum is actually pretty close. And it tries to actually help, help a little bit to open more the LVOT and they didn't perform any mitral valve surgery. So what other surgical options we have here? Uh, when we actually have a patient with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, some of the other options that you can do is an extended myectomy. And we will discuss a little bit about uh, that uh, on the second case, okay? Extended myectomy means standard myectomy plus you go past the coaptation point of the mitral valve when you are suspecting that you are at risk of SAM after the surgery. The papillary mus muscle release is exactly what we did in that case. It's just to bring the mitral valve apparatus to drop posteriorly into the LV, so it releases a little bit more the LV. Anterior mitral lift replication, that was the multi-choice question that I actually uh, put here at the beginning of the case. And it's normally indicated because it shortens the redundant anterior lift net, and then it takes away the predisposition to SAM, okay? And other techniques that have been described, uh, edge to edge mitral valve repair, posterior leaflet to slide in plasty or alfieri stitch. So this is the post-op image. So the gradients uh, were actually back to normal. The uh, LB thickness like uh, significantly reduced to only 16 millimeters. There was no ventricular septal defect since. We see a couple of septal perforate, perforators on the arrows are marking during diastolic flow. And is we, we got what we consider residual mitral uh, regurgitation with uh, cordal sum. And the cordal sum, we means when the anterior mitral leaflets pass the coaptation uh, length actually intercedes into the LBOT without touching your septum, okay? Perfect. So again, always remember when we, when we assess uh, mitral valves, that's the matter. You don't have to stay in a single view. You always go through the whole valve, pre and post-op, okay? Because you don't want to miss anything. So in that case, and very sure we all agree that the results were um, only mild regurgitation. So here we have the pre, here we have the post. So the big question that we have, and when we do those cases is, should we go ahead and always do something to the mitral valve? So there is this um, impressive article uh, um, from Minnesota where they actually published uh, in 1800 patients. And they find that with isolated myectomy in hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy patients, patients with more than moderate to severe mitral regurgitation from 54% they went down to 1.7% after isolated myectomy. And the recommendations and conclusions is you shouldn't touch the mitral valve unless there is something specific into the mitral valve that you want to address. But if it's only because of uh, Hocom, you shouldn't touch it. But then we find this very interesting arguing and an editorial answer to this paper in 2017, which the question was to add or not to add mitral valve surgery to the septal myectomy in Hocom patients. So the, the group that actually replied to this article um, was a group from the States too. They only have like 100 patients compared to the 1800, but they always do uh, different uh, mitral um, 
my daughter at first. And the results were equally good. So that was the question. So for them is, if you know that there is always a little bit of an anomaly in the mitral valve, I think you should be untreated. But then there is the discussion. If with only an isolated myectomy, you're able to only get 1.7% of the patients with uh, my, uh, consistent, like considerably like mitral regurgitation, should we do it or we shouldn't? Okay, and then if we do it, which kind of surgery? So there are a couple of um, articles that are uh, recently published. The, the most recent one that I was able to find is the one from 2017, okay, where it actually had better survival and less thrombotic events when they did repair obvious mitral valve replacements, okay, in, in, in these kind of surgeries. So key points, uh, MR jet is going to be Holcomb related to some, it's posteriorly redirected and it's dynamic. So when you measure, you try to adjust when you find your, 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 maximum, your maximum jet, okay? 20, up to 20% of the patients have MR unrelated to some in this scenario. And uh, the indications or the recommendations for actually do application and the matter of leaflet. So, it's when you have a floppy or lax anterior leaflet, when it measures more than three anterior leaflet or more than 60 millimeters per meter to the square, when you have at least moderate or more regurgitation, when you have sans, and when you have any rheumatic or intrinsic matter about disease. That's the formal recommendations, okay? So the next case, uh, we are going to talk about MR in Hocum patients, but then we have uh, another comorbidity on the, on the mitral valve. So again, different scenario, 74 years old, 174 centimeters, 83 kilos. The patient diagnosed with Holcomb, uh, transthoracic shows 74 millimeters with Valsalva, severe sun, moderate to severe MR, with an elongated mitral valve leaflet and an RVSP of 40. Concomitant abnormalities, atrial fibrillation, a smoker, OSA on uh, CPAP, and a little bit of GERD. So we don't have pre-op images uh, for this uh, Gentlemen, but then the multi choice question before we start the case is which of the following uh, are not associated with susceptibility to SAM? Anterior matter level of more than three, C set distance, and we will talk about it in a second, more than 2.75 centimeters, uh, anterior posterior matter level ratio less than 1.5, residual length beyond the coaptation point of the anterior matter level valve or the anterior matter leaflet measuring more than 60 millimeters to the uh, meters to the square, okay? So this is the intraoperative assessment. In this case, as you can see, there is no formal sum, there is only a form of uh, cordal sum, but it's very interesting when you go to the long axis to actually pay attention a little bit here, because it seems like there is an excessive movement about the, the, co-optation, uh, the co-optation point, okay? So again, we need more images. So that's what we're going to be doing. So we assess, we already discussed that, the number four here, that's what we want. And then an interesting concept is the concept of the C-set, okay? The C-set was described for mitral valve repair. And the C-set will give you like the distance between the coaptation point on the mitral valve up to the septum. If it's less than 275 centimeters, like it was here, which is, it was two, so it, there is a predisposition of sun, okay? So anterior mitral leaflet, definitely more than three centimeters. And then the posterior mitral leaflet to actually get the ratio, which was in this case, more than 1.5, okay? And there is, after the coaptation point, a uh, residual length of the anterior mitral leaflet. So all these three yellow uh, mark are going to be susceptible of uh, inducing some in that patient, okay? So, we go to the color flow to assess, okay, long axis view, mesophageal long axis view, of the aortic valve, the mitral there, posteriorly directed jet, as we can see here, as we can see here on the vena contracta. Okay, we go to the four chamber view, modify to the left, uh, focusing on the mitral with color compare. We go a little bit farther in, and then I want you to pay attention a little bit over here, which you're going to see it in a second there now. Okay, seems to be like something that is not on my 
Okay. Even here that it looks normal, but in the other two planes, it doesn't look uh, no, uh, normal, okay? So we went in and we did a 3D echo. And then what we were able to find in the 3D echo, and it's much more clear in the 2D images. And that's why I'm advocating for that, okay? You should uh, be able to actually expose your whole valve. And if you can all see here, posterior leaflet, okay? This is an emphase view. This is the aortic bug. This is the mitral bug, left lateral appendix, pulmonary bug, tricuspid bug. Okay. And you can perfectly see the posterior ring here, the anterior ring over here, and even the anterior ring here is actually hiding below this. Okay. And if you pay attention here in the color, you have the classic posteriorly directed jet, but you have another jet that goes anteriorly. Okay which it makes us think uh, was wrong with this patient, no? So we mentioned to the surgeon, we think the, the, the patient may have a, 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 it may have a prolapse of the P1 segment. Just have a look, let us know what you think, okay? Because we are seeing those jets here. So again, in this case, we know like uh, mitral regurgitation associated with some is not described at this classification. But in this case, there was certainly like the posterior segment and it will be included in the type two, okay? So the surgeon did a septal myectomy, pretty big. They did a mitral valve repair and we are going to comment on that in a second. He did a closure of the left atrial appendix and a resection, a resection for shortening of the ascending aorta. Okay, so that's the post-op image. So interestingly, we go here, the septum is reduced to 15 millimeters, but the c set distance, which we go there, it's only 1.4 uh, centimeters, okay? But interestingly though, there is only very, very minimal re uh, residual, residual MR, no? Why? It's because of the type of, uh, of surgery that we choose performing that patient. And there is more images of the type of surgery. So this is in the fourth chamber view. So it is, this is going to the mitral commissure view again, minimal residual MR. And I'm very sure that you guys all agree that this is only mild MR, what is left there, unless. So so if you look at the 3D images, it is very clear here that you can see actually between A2 and P2, something binding those two leaflets there, those scalps, okay? And the 3D color assessing that. So what the surgeon did was an alfier stitch, A2 to P2. Not all the surgeons like to actually do alfier stitch. The durability of the repair is not as great, but in this case, I think it was actually a, a good case to actually uh, uh, place here because I knew my my other uh, partners were actually exposing cases of mitral valve uh, uh, replacements and repairs, okay? In a different way with anuloplastics. So in this case, we changed completely the, the subject and we need to assess for mitral stenosis, okay? So we check for velocity, more than 2.5 is severe. The normal velocity should be below 1.9. And this is a little bit borderline, okay? Mean gradient between five and 10, more than 10 severe, less than five. And then again, the gradient is a little bit high. So we do pressure half time. What is going to tell us uh, pressure half time? So if it's more than 200, uh, it's, it's going to be tight. It's going to be a tight valve. If it's less than 130, and then this is in the degree of probably uh, a little bit moderate, okay? So you tell the surgeon, and that's actually important when you assess this kind of valves. So key points on this case, you want your uh, C-set distance after the surgery, not in the case of an alfier stitch, but when you do a refer on the mitral valve, to be, to be actually um, more than 275 centimeters to avoid some. And you want your anterior and posterior ratio to be more than 1.5, so you can avoid some, okay? Again, 20, up to 20% of the patients have MR related to some, so you need to look like in all the views to this mitral valve to be sure that you don't miss anything. And always perform a full 
a full assessment, okay? And that's it. <laughs> Uh, thank you again, uh, Jacobo, for a great talk. Uh, there's a question on the board here. Would it be acceptable acceptable to do pressure halftime in a repaired nitro valve? Yeah, well, as 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 uh, as as we saw there, um, pressure halftime is is part of the recommendation for uh, for actually uh, assessing any prosthesis or or repairs in in mitral valves. So it's part of the guidelines again. So the main, the main, the main things that you need to look is first the velocity, then you go to the main gradients, and then the recommendation is to go with the the DVI or the BTI, the relationship between the BTI in the LVOT and in the mitral valve. And if it's more than two point five uh, on the mitral valve compared to the to the LVOT, then it's actually increased. And then that's a, a sign of, of this mitral valve to be too tight for the patient. And again, the other the other um, uh, things that we are going to look if is effective for if this area, which is less than one, is again going to be a significant stenosis of this uh, repair and a pressure half time of more than 200. Thank you, uh, Jacobo. Uh, one more question for you. Uh, the vena contracta is typically measured at 120 uh, metasophageal view. I noticed okay. in, your, uh, in your slides, you calculate the PISA at zero degrees in one slide, or minutes in four chamber, and in another picture, there was a long axis view. Where is the typical place to measure PISA? Or PISA recomm recommended for chamber view. Okay, thank you. PISA is, is always recommended for the four chamber view, at least that's by the guidelines, but remember, Chris, like uh, the guidelines, uh, are mostly described for transthoracic. So it will be your apical view, that's the one that they actually use. But the PISA, if we can, we should measure in the four chamber view and then the vena contracta in the long axis view, uh, which is will be your equivalent to the parasternal long axis in your transthoracic. And you're completely right. Thank you. 